Um, so um, this evening uh, we're going to be uh, starting with uh, giving each of the candidates uh, two minutes to uh, give an opening pitch to you, uh, to give a little bit of time for them to um, uh, explore uh, with you their policies and the relevance for the particular theme of this evening, climate change and climate action. Um, and then uh, we have a number of questions that have been submitted, uh, and we've tried to group those and sort of take them as in themes, um, and then the candidates will be allowed a, a minute each to respond, or up to a minute each to respond, and Sunita is kindly going to be uh, timekeeping for them, and keep, we'll try and keep them straight so that we can get through as many of those questions as we can uh, during the course of the evening, um, and then uh, we'll uh, offer them each a minute to sum up at the end. Um, so, uh, if that's all clear, yes, lovely, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll make a start, and we're, uh, we're seated in alphabetical order by surname, in fairness, uh, and we'll start uh, at this end, uh, and uh, we will we'll take it in turns to start. So, at the moment, we're starting with, with Tom, and so... Uh, over to you, Tom, if you'd like to grab that microphone. Great, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for hosting the Hustings. It's a, a really novel um, standout event out of all the different ones we've got going on. So my name's Tom Gordon. I'm originally from Nottingley, born and raised in Yorkshire. Um, and I went up to university and my background is a scientist. I did my first degree in biochemistry before switching to do a master's in public health. And I've always been interested, interested in how things work, why things happen, um, and that's what sort of drove me into getting into politics in a way. Um, when I was at university doing my master's degree, my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I dropped down and did my degree over two years to help out at home, looking after her and my little sister. Um, I'd always understood that the system was there to help people in their hour of need, um, but sadly it's been cut to ribbons and not much left. Um, it was that experience that made me wonder when we're meant to be one of the richest countries in the world, why so little support is available for people when they need it most. Um, it was a sort of really quite grueling experience, but fortunately we came out of it the other side all okay and my mum recovered and as well. Um, but once we got through that, I started going, well, why, what's happened, what's gone wrong um, and what can be done to fix it? And that's not a simple answer, nothing in politics is. Anyone who tries to sell you an easy, simple answer um, is a, you know, <laughs> selling you short, quite frankly. Um, I'm really pleased that our manifesto, the Liberal Democrats, is um, very bold when it comes to what we want to see on the environment and when it comes to the climate crisis. We want a fair deal for the environment. We think everyone should be able to enjoy our natural environment and the benefits of it, and our children should be able to inherit a planet that's still here for them. Um, and that's what we're faced with. We have the biggest issue, you know, the climate crisis coming down the tracks, and the government we've currently seen under sort of underfunding and cutting um, our commitments on the world stage. Um, the time has gone off. <laughs> um, we must act now, both locally, nationally, and internationally, to make sure we get lead the world with innovation, ingenuity, and make sure we boost our co economy and quality of life as we go forward. Um, we'll be putting climate change at the heart of our new industrial strategy to cut bills, emissions, and make sure that people can afford to live. Thank you, Tom. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'd normally stand for this, but it feels a little bit too intimate for me to stand up and, uh, and just chat. So I'm just going to go through uh, my conversation with you as such. Do you ever get so frustrated that things aren't quite right and feel that you should do something about it? I did in 2014, and I stood for, to become a councillor. I won by a mere 12 votes, but I still won. And I stood again in 2017 to become a county councillor when the relief road was threatening Nid Gorge. The leading parties are promising to be marginally better than the other, or is it less bad than the other? That's hardly an inspiring vision. So I'm standing in this election because I believe I can do something different. My day job involves helping companies and people change quickly to deal with the evolving nature of their jobs in the marketplace. I help them through their many challenges, including complying with environmental, social and governance and embracing the circular economy. It's quite clear to me that we need to challenge the status quo. It's madness to think that more of the same thing will yield different results. We need to make change for the better. We need to do it at pace. That is why I'm standing as an independent in this election, free from party shackles, to 
bring fresh ideas to bear. I'm a fighter and I'm doing this because I think I'm I think it's the right thing to do. Today, it's shocking that climate change is number eight or nine on the doorstep. It's the first time in the last four elections that it has not been number three or four. Now it's the cost of living and then the NHS. I'm fighting this election on fairer funding uh, for council. Our council gets about a third less per head than the equivalent metro council. And for fairer council tax, we pay about 25% more than the equivalent council in London. However, I will be championing the fight against climate change. The focus needs to be on those items that put money in people's pockets or minimise uh, the pressure on their pockets while the country starts its economic, uh, economic recovery. I look forward to tonight's questions and understanding which parts of the climate change most concern. Thank you, Paul. Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Jemima, and thank you to Zero Carbon Harrogate for organising these climate hustings. just want to say right away that I think that climate change is happening now and that the scale of this global challenge has been clear for many years. But we should also recognise that we've seen significant UK leadership, but that should be used as a spur to take on further action. And I say leadership because we have been the first major economy that has cut its carbon emissions by 50%. And it's the law that we will be net zero by 2050. We obviously have ambitious targets along the way. These are the carbon budgets. The first three of these have been achieved and we're ahead of schedule for budget four, which runs up to 2027 and requires a 52% reduction. Now I've taken action as part of the work to hit that target and it's been long-term commitment. If I give you a quick example of what that looks like, 20 years ago was the councillor leading the project to uh, put ground source heat pumps into off-grid council houses. That was a UK first. As MP and Minister, I introduced ideas and supported initiatives from grid reform to zero emission buses, uh, from a contract for different uh, difference auction, that's critical to the rollout of offshore wind, and to lobby for more funding for our area. And we've seen the benefits of that with grants to improve the environmental performance of our public buildings. The project at our hospital is probably the most significant, but schools and leisure facilities have also benefited. I think we should be really positive in our presentation of the work on this issue and view it as an opportunity. Positive, as we have nearly half a million people employed in skilled, well-paid green jobs, and the economy has grown by 80% as we cut carbon by 50. I think these facts will help us take people with us because being pragmatic is critical. The global spike in energy prices caused by Putin's invasion of Ukraine brought home the urgency of energy resilience. If I am re-elected, I would champion that energy resilience and how people can make a difference. Energy is just one part of the challenges ahead and I know we'll cover more, uh, more range this evening. So we have a good record and that creates a strong platform for the future. It's been a priority for me personally, and given the chance, that will continue. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and over to Sean. Good evening, everyone. My name's Sean Oakes, and um, I'm very proud to be standing as the Harrogate and Nursborough Green Party candidate. I've previously stood for Parliament here and before that in the East Riding of Yorkshire and for Europe for the Yorkshire and the Humber Green Party. Uh, I was second on, on the list. I've been pretty desperate about the way humans treat humans and other animals since I was about eight, which is why I've ended up in politics, something I would never have dreamed I'd be doing. Um, I, I started off in teaching after a, a degree in um, combined arts and education development um, work in local authorities, Humberside and City of York Council and the Safer York Partnership. Um, Bill and I spent 30 months working in Uganda, 2001 to 4, which made a huge impression on me and taught me a huge amount. Um, when we returned to the UK, I did a master's degree in education for sustainability and we felt the only worthwhile thing for us to do was to campaign to try to stop the downward spiral into climate and biodiversity crises. I've spent my whole life concerned about injustice to people and other animals, 
Now there's also a terrifying climate crisis and an extinction crisis, our own extinction if we don't wake up. There's so much avoidable pain, misery and destruction in the world and that's why I'm doing this very challenging thing. But I've been, I've been forced into it by sheer desperation at the appalling effects on people and nature caused by a very stagnant and dangerous political ideology, neoliberalism, which is actually part of the establishment, which is the establishment. The Green Party is radically challenging this, saying we have to really wake up, not just fiddle around the edges. Um, so things have just got worse. We used to think things would get better, but there's a lot we have to do to make that happen. Uh, look at some of the things we used to think Shall were... I? Sorry, if you I've can, got, I haven't got if my glasses on. <laughs> I'll finish, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean, and uh, over to Conrad. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today at Zero Carbon Harrogate. Uh, and I'm really excited to be able to talk about what is the most pressing issue of our time. So my name is Conrad Whitcroft. I'm the Labour candidate. And today we need to address the climate crisis, a problem that's often ignored or exacerbated, but one I will face up to if I'm lucky enough to be elected as your MP. For me, the impact of a climate catastrophe is not just a far distant future, but simply the way my life might look by the time I'm the age of some of my fellow candidates. We need a strong national government to take a progressive stance to tackle that crisis. And the word crisis is one that we've heard a lot of in the past four years. We've had the coronavirus crisis, something that still exists for people with long COVID and their loved ones, the cost of living crisis exacerbated by Liz Truss's financial policy. We have the housing crisis, leaving the dream of home ownership further out of reach than ever for my generation. And much more than that, I think in this country we can see a crisis of confidence, one that manifests in the lack of meaning we may feel about our own lives and the way we may treat one another. Now, some people have said I'm too young to run for parliament. Now, it's true that I am 24 years old, but if it's any consolation, I'll be 25 by the time you can vote for me. In other words, the people of Harrogate and Knaresborough have the opportunity to give me the best birthday present ever. I think my age on this issue actually gives me an advantage. I know that people of my generation have been standing up against the climate crisis and trying to do something different. I want to be a part of that fight. And I know that quick fixes or mudslinging simply isn't a way to solve the climate crisis, but hard work and a long-term plan will. Now, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, I'll be looking back for re-election around my 30th birthday. And on that day, I don't think I'll be looking back and saying, job done, climate crisis is solved. I'm not going to sell you false promises. Keir Starmer talks about a decade of national renewal to solve the problems that we face. Labour will set up a publicly owned energy company and invest in renewables, publicly owned railways to encourage public transport, an environmentalist approach that will run like a stick of rock through everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay. So, we're round one complete, as it were. Thank you, and thank you for sticking to the time. That was really appreciated. Um, and we're going to start on our questions. And we're going to start with something that is very close to um, Zero Carbon Harrogate's heart, uh, because we, uh, Zero Carbon Harrogate, have a, an extensive retrofit uh, program running. Um, we've been trying to uh, fill the gap uh, between um, the skills that are needed to, um, uh, in our local economy to uh, enable our homes to be retrofitted um, and also um, raise awareness among homeowners so that they understand the whole process of retrofitting and decarbonising their homes. So we're going to start with a question uh, on buildings and retrofitting um, and it will go to Paul first, just to let you know. Um, so, Zero Carbon Harrogate has been really active in encouraging energy retrofitting for houses and other buildings. This is going to require a massive scaling up of activity to meet the legal requirement to decarbonise by 2050. What do you think are the key actions required and what policies will you champion to deliver these? So the very first thing is that we need to make sure that the planning process and the standards of planning, so every new house we build is actually the right standard, because for every new house we build right now, uh, we have to retrofit it. But in terms of retrofitting, I'm a great believer that the MP should be the centre 
of what goes on locally as well as a, a national position. And I'd be liaising with the mayor who has authority for this type of thing and about economic development. So I'd be looking for, uh, we already have a ready market for houses that need retrofitting, particularly in what I'd call the affordable homes uh, and uh, the social housing, and we can start and build that market there. So that would be the first thing I'd be looking at. But the second thing is that I'd be looking to use the economic boosters that the mayor can provide in terms of uh, get, setting up a company to retrofit, perhaps to match and uh, work with zero carbon, but also a company that manufactures the items that the retrofit companies need, and that's the supply chain. So we're skilling up all the time. And those are the things I'd do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're passing along then to Andrew. This is a very interesting and challenging question because we have so many homes that will need retrofitting. I think it really comes down to uh, a couple of areas. Firstly, there needs to be some financial support to homeowners to help them with this task because it is not cheap. That means government schemes, and we have some government schemes available now, but we will have more in the future. We also must make sure we have the supply chain of people to come in and actually do the work. We have now also over 200 different green apprenticeships. Harrogate College is about to rebuild, and as it rebuilds, it will include a renewable energy training hub. So that's about making sure that we have the skills in our area to deliver what we will need. But this is a really very challenging question, one of the most complex questions in climate change. But if we don't tackle it, we will not hit our overall target. So I will just focus upon uh, financial support for homeowners and for the skills to do the job. Thank you. Sh yep, going along to Sean now. Yes, uh, obviously all the things that people have said and um, the Green Party has a, a, a whole lot of stuff on this which has been worked up on over decades because this is the kind of stuff the Green Party does. So yes, um, we need the right homes in the right place at the right price instead of lots of executive homes in the wrong place, some of which don't even have roofs that are strong enough to put solar panels on, and most of which have gas boilers, even though they're just being built now. Um, it's, it's quite preposterous the, the way regulations have just been removed and developers have been allowed to do pretty much anything they want to make profit. Um, and there's a sort of sense of um, it, it's about profit and not about what is actually needed. So uh, the, there's lots of detail in our manifesto. Um, Providing social homes is another thing. It's getting away from the landlord economy where landlords just do what they like and, well, there's very little regulation. Okay, thanks. I can see you this time. Thank you very much. Excellent question. So I want to talk a bit about skills, particularly in the local economy, Labour's policy of setting up technical colleges of excellence. Now we need to think about the long-term plan there, but also think about the age at which people are going to go through those colleges. By the time that they've reached you know, their 20s, they will hopefully have been able to be trained. We need to encourage more of that vocational education, particularly when it comes to construction, building those passive house designs of the future. Uh, I think education and skills is going to be a crucial part of this because we could talk about building as many passive house or green homes as we want. If we haven't got the people to build them, then it ain't going to happen. I also understand around the need to make sure that we have the planning reforms. Now, I am massively in favour of uh, building more homes. I think that that's a crucial part of my generation. It's the supply and demand problem where, you know, the dream of home ownership has been denied to so many, but we need to make sure that those homes are fit for the future and are carbon ready, and I'm pleased that Labour's plans to reform the planning system will work. And when we talk about the mayor, David Scaife is a Labour mayor. I think that one of the main advantages of voting for me is that I will be able to speak to the mayor and hopefully also the national government as well on your behalf. Thank you very much for the question. So I think one of the things that's really frustrating for a lot of people at the moment is a cost of living crisis and this goes hand in hand with retrofitting homes to make sure they are insulated and uh, people can use less fuel. Um, we want to see uh, warmer and cheaper homes with a 10 year emergency upgrade programme with free, insula free insulation and rolling out heat pumps for people in low income households and ensuring that all new homes are zero carbon. Um, a big issue as well is that the current regulations when you come to building new homes um, fall far shorter than we would expect 
Um, you know, it frustrates me when you see massive warehouses along the motorway, along the A1, the M62, trying to incentivise them to clad those in solar panels to make sure we're harnessing all the opportunities to generate electricity. Um, I mean, and the same goes too when it comes to uh, homes as well. We want to see an expansion of incentives to install uh, rooftop solar power, including a guaranteed fair price for people selling electric back into the grid. And that's one of the biggest barriers that we've seen sort of um, in recent years that sort of faded away and why people aren't doing that. Thank you. So, flowing on from that, um, we're going to move on to a question um, about planning and development, uh, staying, staying sort of broadly with, with homes. Um, and this is from um, Paula Shrimpton. Shrimpton. If Paula, are you here? Hello, Paula. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so, Paula says, my concerns are for the continued development of greenfield for building um, how are the candidates going to preserve greenfield and stop overdevelopment and ensure that all developments are incorporating green solutions for building materials and energy consumption? Um, and we start with Andrew when you're ready. Well, this is a tricky question because I think we do need more housing, but at the same time we need to protect our countryside. And I'm particularly keen on protecting our green belt, which I know that a, uh, an incoming Labour government has said that they would um, allow building in. What we need to do is, uh, quite frankly, increase the density of building in our existing towns to protect our open spaces. That will mean quite a variety of different areas, um, but we focus upon increasing that urban density, but also making sure that we have urban environments which are uh, environmentally friendly and bringing green spaces to make it an urban living which is much more attractive for people. We need to also make sure we have a, a hierarchy of where development will go. So it should be brownfield first, bring empty properties back into use, make sure that we use uh, the lower caliber land before we embark upon higher quality agricultural land and sacrosanct is the green belt. So there's a variety of different initiatives here, but it's all about making sure we do have the houses we need. It's not, not lots of big houses, it's lots of what used to be called starter homes for people. Uh, and get those in the right place and uh, make sure that we, we deliver for people. Yes, yep, go for Sean. Yep, loving. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that communities can do is something that's actually happening around here and has happened with the um, community purchase of Longlands Common um, in terms of rescuing Greenbelt from not only housing but also roads. And currently, Knaresborough Forest Park, which is the project to add to that uh, just between Knaresborough and Starbeck. Um, and you know that doing something really positive like that is is a fantastic fillip for the community to really uh, really protect land but as people have said we've got to retrofit one thing that really bothers me is the VAT issue VAT is charged on retrofitting but not on new build I mean how crazy is that that needs to change um, we need to encourage people to be able to retrofit because the housing stock in this country is massive. You can't just bulldoze everything and put new thing, new passive house up as much as we all want to get to passive house standards. So uh, that's, that's a, a big biggie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm afraid I'm going to probably have to disagree with the premise of your question. As you might imagine, I'm passionately pro-house building uh, because I'm a member of that generation that due to chronic underbuilding of housing and the inability to properly develop, we're just not going to own our own home. The price of a house has gone up and up and up. The age at which the first time buyer has gone up. My dad was my age when he bought his first home. I'm afraid I'm nowhere near and I won't be until I'm in my 30s. I'm passionately pro-development. When it comes to the green belt, of course it's right that areas of natural beauty are protected. That needs to be done. But there are areas of the green belt that are simply not green. There are places like disused car parks, old industrial sites, places that would in no way qualify for the green belt if it were established now. And yet it must be protected because it is sacrosanct. The green belt was designated in 1945. The world has massively changed. And I will say, if you are passionate about the green belt, Labour's plans to reform it would protect green areas, but if you don't do anything, green, building on the green belt is already allowed if you don't meet 10% of your or 5% of your housing demands. So we need to reform, we need to change the way we do things, we need to build more houses. 
So we're coming back up to Tom now. Oh, we've got our microphones and migrated down the table. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I agree with, broadly speaking, what a lot of people said already. Um, I think the key thing is, is that we need to make sure that communities are engaged throughout the planning process. Um, I know that Zero Carbon Harrogate have been linking in with um, Harrogate Civic Society, talking about a neighbourhood plan, and that's something I absolutely support, uh, making sure that people have an understanding of what they want in their local areas and priorities when it comes to things like housing, transport and business needs. Um, Brownfield development site already is, this is a sort of bit of a con that I think everyone seems to sort of trot out, is that we should presume and go after Brownfield first. Well, that already does happen, because developers know it's easier to get planning on Brownfield sites. Um, so to suggest this is something new or novel an approach anyone would take is a little bit misleading. Um, I, I think the point which was made about increasing density is really key. Um, one of the problems we've actually got is lots of empty retail units and um, flats above stores. Actually bringing people back into our towns, living and breathing and spending and working, is, is how we can make you know, a big, quick, easy win on that front. End amount of time. Thank you. Um, over the last few months, I've actually... Uh, written and met with every council on North Yorkshire Council because I believe that the local plan is the centre of how we get this under control. It's about engaging with local people and ensuring that whether it's green belt land or whether it's brownfield, urban densities, this whole thing has to be discussed. But there's a challenge in that not enough people get involved and then they're surprised when something turns up in the plan. So I really want to get everybody fully involved in this. The comments that I made to the councillors were to do with the fact that there are, it's not a silo thing. We have to look at the local transport plan, we have to look at the local economic plan, as well as the climate change plan. And by pulling all these three things together, I believe that we can attack the carbon emissions that come from our buildings, transport and businesses. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question um, comes from Sarah Gibbs, who I don't think is with us tonight. I think she said she wouldn't be able to be with us. But this is going to be a quick-fire question, and I'm asking for a yes or no answer uh, from our candidates. Um, and we start with Sean, just to warn you, Sean. <laughs> so um, this is bringing it rather more locally. Um, and so Sarah asks... Um, do you support the 600 plus members of the public who want to save their asset of community value woodland, Rotary Wood, from Danome Harrogate spring water development? Or do you prioritise profit over people and planet? So it's a yes for support and a no for not supporting. <laughs> yes, I don't, yes. Uh, yes, it's a yes or no, Sean. <laughs> oh, I hate yes or no questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid no at this point. No? Okay. Coming back to, uh, do we just get that microphone to Tom? For a... uh, yes. My turn. Yep. I'm going to have to sort of prevaricate on this because I could all... Paul, it's, no, it's not yes or no. No, 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 it's no, it, yes no, no. It, seriously, I... I no, it's okay. nothing to do with being a politician. Paul, it's to do with the fact that I'm on the planning committee... Uh, so, therefore, but what I would say is that I would always put people before profit. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for qualifying as, as you are on the planning committee. That is a difficult uh, one to ask you. Andrew, sorry. Thank you. And you can't politicise planning. If you do politicise planning, what you do is you make it easier for developers to win on appeal. So, it, 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 uh, it, extreme it, caution uh, required. Yeah. Thank you, so Andrew. All, all it's, a yes, I can it's a yes or no. <laughs> no, no, it isn't, because um, I'm afraid it's a complex question. And uh, you, that, you that, need to just you. simply uh, yep. recognise that. We've, I would I could give you a comment on that plan. We've re but we're not doing comments, Andrew. We've, rec we've recognised it's complex. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll give you the opportunity to comment, comment now. And this question starts with, it will be Conrad starting on it. And uh, we're moving on then to think about the relationship between the, the climate and the nature emergencies. Um, and uh, Joe, Joe Webb submitted this question. Thank you, Joe, for your question. Um, and uh, I, perhaps I should declare that Joe is the chair of Yorkshire, am I allowed to say this, Joe? The Yorkshire Wildlife Trust? Yes, <laughs> it's very pertinent, isn't it? So, um, 
As well as climate, another part of our life support system, nature, is in a state of crisis. What do you see as the links between the climate and nature emergencies, and how would you tackle both in an effective way? Conrad, we'll start with you. I'll roll up that in now. Uh, thank you, Joe. Excellent question. And, of course, talking about the nature crisis and the climate crisis, how they interlink, it's a really uh, complicated and, and interesting way of talking about it. Of course, completely terrifying at the same time. Um, I feel incredibly worried about the decline of different species that we're seeing in relation to it. Now, for me, uh, in terms of being able to having to deal with the climate crisis, we talk a lot about adaption to how we're going to have to adapt as humans to the way that the climate in some ways has irrevocably changed. Obviously, animals and plants and nature do not have that ability. I am in favour of making sure that the planning system gets properly reformed so that we protect the environment. People talk a lot about things like swift bricks and ideas that we can use to make houses more sustainable and live within nature as well. I'm very much in favour of doing that. We need to reform the planning rules to do that but also the focus on carbon emissions as well. We need to think about, you know, it goes back to that sort of bread and butter, the greenhouse gas, how we're going to lower that. The trick to that is investing in renewables, investing in nuclear power, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels, and I think the best way to do that is through Great British Energy, which is the Labour Party's policy. Okay. So coming up to Tom now. Sorry, just need the microphone to come up. Thank you. I think one of the, uh, build on what Conrad's just said and say, you know, embedding nature-based solutions um, throughout whenever we build and plan things going forward, thinking about that green um, environment and how we can expand it into our urban environment. Um, I think one of the things we need to see as well is making sure that when there is national um, infrastructure decisions made, that there is the National Infrastructure Commission to look at the account and the, take into account the environmental impact on new projects. Um, it's not just about climate change, like you say, it is also about um, the nature and the impact on wildlife. Um, I think as well the other point I'd make is, again, that if we just go back to having a ban on new coal mines and um, you know, maintain the ban on fracking, um, stopping carbon emissions is going to be key to, to the nature crisis. Um, and I don't think that should be contentious. Yeah, it's very important this, that we have the uh, nature recovery alongside. So for me, I mentioned the local plan last time, so the local plan has to involve uh, how we are going to do our nature recovery and the land recovery. So that's a critical part. At the moment, we are poisoning our air, our water, and our land, and we have to find different ways of doing things, whether that's the way we deal with sewage, the way we deal with emissions out the back of the cars, whether it's particles, etc. So we have to work on all of these things. But I think we need to look at the nature restoration element. For me, farmers and the the farmers, the best farmers, are also environmentalists, and I think we have to support the farmers. We have to help them through the change to regenerative farming and to how they can help. So perhaps using less pesticides, if any at all, and all those type of things. I think that is where we will really make biggest inroads and fastest. We also need to be conscious of the need for food security. Thank you. I think there is a great overlap between the two areas here and we can't make progress on climate without thinking about the natural loss that has experienced uh, ever since really the industrial revolution right across the world. It's a proper crisis and the, we can't make progress on one without the other. What, we've talked a little bit about carbon already, uh, so the key obviously is to reduce that. But we haven't mentioned actually is that the UK has been the first country in the world to set a legal duty to halt the decline of nature and to do so by 2030. That was in the Environment Act of 2021, and that brings legal protections for nature, finding targets to improve, uh, improve standards on, on cutting pollution. So the two have to go hand in hand, and a final point, put nature at the heart of planning decisions. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, the two are completely connected. Um, an example would be the, we need to reduce emissions. I think pretty much everybody agrees with that. And that also connects with cleaner air. Um, if we, we, have, we do things which, which reduce the emissions, it, it improves the air quality. Nature is utterly bombarded and has been for a long time, and this country is the most depleted, nature depleted, um, I believe. And uh, certainly going to Uganda taught me a lot about um, what I expected to see there. I was horrified at, at 
what loss there was in Uganda, and it, it sort of threw light on what was going on here as well. Um, there needs to be political commitment about this. I think the public is way ahead of the uh, politicians on this one. People generally care about nature and worry about it. Bees, swifts, uh, the fact we, you know, you used to get your windscreen covered in insects, there's nothing now. Uh, De uh, Green Party wants to do a Rights of Nature Act to give it personhood. Uh, yeah, I'll stop. Have you, uh, Tom, <laughs> you've done, haven't you? Sorry, yes, we've got to the end of the end of the road. Right, so we'll be going to a another quick yes and no question. Let's see if we could, we can uh, put our candidates uh, doing better on a yes or no answer this time round. So we'll be starting with Tom on this one, um, and we're moving on to the theme of uh, transport, um, and uh, we've got a question from um, Sally Elif. Hello, Sally. Nice to have you with us. Um, and Sally has asked, and we're going, looking for a yes or no uh, answer here, countless people own holiday homes abroad and fly out to them most weekends. Uh, the excuse being that it's cheaper and quicker than by rail. This causes huge CO2 emissions. Do you intend to place additional taxes on those who use short-haul flights unnecessarily and regularly? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Uh, no, that's not Labour Party policy. Thank you very much. Gosh, we managed a yes and no round. Fantastic. We're getting the idea. So, yes, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, having got the gist of this, I've got another yes and no quick quiz for you uh, on transport. And um, this comes from um, Colin Elliff. Thank you, Colin. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have a longer answer on transport in a minute, but this is kind of leading into our longer, longer question. Uh, so, Paul, you get to start this one. Um, <laughs> um, Harrogate has good public transport links to Leeds, York and Ripon. But uh, to most other North Yorkshire towns, public transport links are almost non-existent. Will you support the establishment of an integrated bus and rail network to link all major communities across North Yorkshire? Of course, yes. Integration, good, yes. Yes. Also yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, just catch up with Colin then later. Fantastic. Um, so, then uh, looking in a little bit more detail and um, keeping it local on our transport theme, um, with transport being such a huge and relatively stagnant area in our um, carbon emissions for this area, um, Thomas Barrett. Hello, Tom. Good to have you with us. Has asked um, this question, which will go to Andrew first. Um, schemes including the station gateway, Otley Road cycle path, phase two, and the Beach Grove LTN, local uh, low traffic neighbourhood, sorry, um, have either been scrapped or scaled back in recent years. Has North Yorkshire Council let Harrogate and Knaresborough down on active travel? Well, I think it could do a lot better on active travel than it has. And I think the Ockley Road cycle path was uh, not a well-executed scheme, and that has put back some of the uh, appetite, I think, around our area for more cycle schemes. So I think a uh, straight answer to your question, Thomas, is uh, can do quite significantly better. And I think improving sustainable uh, transport is going to be critical to making our town centres and our city centres across the nation significantly better places, uh, improving air quality, cutting carbon emissions, etc. So um, no progress on transport, no hitting our overall net zero target in 2050. And uh, I see that the... Um, sustainability of that transport will be a pretty fundamental part of how we make progress. Thank you, Andrew. On to Sean. 
Yes, it, obviously we, ha we have to really hit transport hard. Um, and one thing that the, the Greens say is we need to make routes between settlements so that people can actually walk and cycle between settlements, not just leisure cycling and so on, but getting to places actively. Of, of course, with the integrated public transport, because not everybody can do the walking and cycling. Um, it, it's absolutely crucial, and, and I'm in the buses, I use the buses a lot, and you, you've got bus shelters with no shelters, just a stick, you know, with probably no, not much information, nothing to sit on. How is that encouraging people to use the buses? So um, that's, that's a major area of improvement, and taking the, them into public hands would, as they've done in West Yorkshire, as they used to be, would really improve things. Um, well, it would make a massive difference because it would be run for people, not for profit. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks very much for your question. Um, yes, but it's not all just down to North Yorkshire Council. It's also down to the planning system as it exists. Our planning system is biased essentially in favour of doing nothing unless you are a massive developer or you've got loads of private sector money. Local councils really struggle with their already stretched finances to deliver on these sorts of infrastructure projects. Now I think that we need to think nationally about this, which is where Labour's planning reforms will come in to make it easier for councils to be able to do this. I think we also need to think regionally. And David Skate's election as uh, Mayor of York and North Yorkshire, I think is going to provide a really positive impetus for development of active travel, but also that publicly owned and integrated rail network that Colin was talking about as well. David Skate's policy is to introduce a municipally run bus service which will be run for the people instead of profit. I mean, it's good to have cycle paths. I don't think anyone could particularly cycle all the way to York or all the way to Scarborough unless they were doing sort of a, an all-day event. Um, so we need to make sure that we have a properly integrated transport system publicly run uh, and I think our mayors and government will be able to achieve that. So I'm sure everyone in the room is well aware that we have a Conservative-run council and it has just been an absolute bodge job when it's come to things like Station Gateway and Otley Road. We should all demand absolutely better than what we've been given. Um, I think the fact that we've ended up in a situation where the council has been open to legal challenges, not just with Station Gateway, but now with Harrogate College putting funding at question is absolutely ridiculous. We, we need to have a professional council that goes out and actually meaningfully engages with the public to come up with schemes that will actually work. We need to bring people along with us rather than try to railroad people into it. Um, you know, the latest, one of the things that's always in the news as well too is about 20 mile an hour zones around schools. I'm absolutely for that. We've ended up with a cabinet member at North Yorkshire who has sort of flip-flopped, tried to ride both horses and sort of annoyed everyone in the process. We need clear answers and leadership on these issues. Um, and that's exactly how we um, should all be acting, really. Um, you know, that's, it, it shouldn't be hard. <laughs> In 2018, or maybe early 2019, 12,500 people told North Yorkshire Council they didn't want a relief road, but they wanted alternative uh, methods to relieve the congestion. That included things like park and ride. Strangely enough, we don't have it yet. It included lots of uh, different cycling routes, walking routes. It included signs on, buses, uh, on bus stops that would tell you when the next bus is coming. A whole raft of things. And one of the things I put in there was I wanted a train station at Clara Road because that would take a lot of cars off the Skipton Road. So yes, North Yorkshire Council has let us down. And not only that, is there's about a 200 page document and I still have it with all the recommendations in. And we should be using that, not trying to reinvent the wheel again. We know what needs to change. We need the will to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say there were quite a lot of questions on transport. It's obviously an area of, of interest and um, if your question wasn't asked, do feel free to come and talk to the candidates afterwards. Um, they're, they're used to being asked difficult questions, I'm sure, on the, on the door, doorstep, so um, feel free to come and have a conversation with them. Um, we're going to move on to energy. Um, and in terms of decarbonising our economy, um, energy is the area that obviously that we've made most progress with um, within the UK. Um, but there's well, clearly a lot still to do. And um, Ralph Armsbury, Ralph, are you here? Ralph, 
Great, good that you're with us. Ralph has asked um, a question about solar panels. He asks, how will you ensure that a useful amount of rooftop solar becomes standard for new houses and commercial properties? Uh, you might want to pick up on that and uh, add to that in thinking about how um, we're going to ensure that Harrogate and Knaresborough become more self-sufficient in renewable energy. Um, as at the moment we clearly import most of our energy into the area um, from outside. So uh, we, sorry, we start with Sean on this one, is that okay? And Sunita's got the time now. Thank you. Um, yes, the first thing with energy is to not use it. So the first thing is to insulate and government should be supporting uh, both landlords and private owners to do that. Uh, with as much with, with everything. Um, the planning uh, arrangements need to underline that and um, solar on roofs is, is absolutely vital. We, that's where the best place is to put solar panels. Obviously they're up there, often they've got nothing overshadowing them and uh, if, we, if we seriously got solar panels onto roofs we wouldn't need to be putting them all over good agricultural land. Uh, we should also be setting up local community energy companies. Um, you could do that in Harrogate. Uh, I know Mike Kay at Oasis has talked, talks a lot about that and is prepared to go and talk to groups about it. In Knaresborough Town, I'm on Knaresborough Town Council and uh, we're supporting a community energy project which, is, um, which will be looking to sure, get energy you. from the river. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ralph. Yeah, um, this needs a national approach, so it can't just be done via uh, locality. I think in terms of trying to become self-sufficient as a constituency, incredibly hard thing to do, but doing it nationally, so that not only are we making our economy cleaner and greener, we're also not as reliant on foreign dictators and people dis that, dis that uh, don't agree with human rights to buy our oil from. We saw that being the problem in the way that um, we were, as an economy, reliant on Russian gas. That needs to change, so I think that Labour's policy of setting up Great British Energy, a, a publicly owned energy energy company, having that national approach. I also think we need to think more about our coastline, not only just offshore wind, but tidal as well. It's worth remembering North Yorkshire has the second biggest coastline of any English county after Cornwall. Why aren't we using more of that? So that's what I, I believe in. I also believe that it's not necessarily about just reducing our power usage, it's making sure we have that cleaner power, going to need it for a growing economy. So that's when we can start talking about nuclear power. We haven't had a nuclear power station that would be safe and efficient in this country for a very long time and that will be much, much more effective for generating the energy we need. So it's a joined up approach, a national approach and Great British Energy is the way to do that. Coming down to Tom. So there's a few things that I'd pick up on what other people have said. Um, we have experts locally in this field. Um, you know, Energy Oasis has won big contracts and actually utilising them across North Yorkshire and the combined authority is really key. Um, I don't agree that it needs to be necessarily a, just a, a national approach. I think we can do things locally. Um, you know, as a party, the Lib Dems have always been key to give uh, powers down to um, the lowest possible level and we want to see local authorities empowered to be able to set up uh, their own community and decentralised energy schemes. Um, you know, that requires building grid infrastructure and investing in storage too um, and that's one of the biggest barriers to this is it's all good and well going out and putting the infrastructure in place but if you've not got that link into the grid or the capacity to be able to store it then you sort of snooker in yourself before you get out of the gates um, we need to permit local energy grids and also ending fossil fuel subsidies for the companies too um, i think that's a way that we push that transition forward thank you I'm going to go back to the question which I think mentioned putting solar panels on roofs. Uh, the key thing here is I'm a great believer in that. I think every house has got to earn its keep. So if we can put a solar panel or a few solar panels on top, then I think that will be very beneficial. I think there needs to be a technology change such that instead of you linking it into the house where they have to have inverters and all sorts of other exciting technology, that maybe it all links together and goes into one central inverter and that it's community. Uh, community raised money. So yes, I, I would like to see something done nationally, but I think we could also look at what we could do locally. Uh, people mentioned Mike Kay, he's, uh, he knows lots of things on this, but I also think we need to look at solar and how we convert, uh, convert uh, to hydrogen energy so that we've got storage so that we can use that as well. Uh, abundant energy is really what we need in this case. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Ralph, for the question. I see a big role for solar, and I think we should be encouraging it. It's quite an expensive thing to install. So if re-elected, I would be supporting the plan for basically a voucher scheme to help people with the cost of this. I think uh, a number of other factors need to come into play, including grid uh, reform, making it easier for some of the larger schemes, perhaps uh, on big business premises, to connect uh, into the grid. At the heart of this, though, we have got a lot of roof space. We must make sure we have the schemes and the system to use it properly. It's an untapped opportunity. Uh, even though we've made good progress, we can go a long way further. And I think the future home standards, which were consulted upon last year, which I think were due to be launched very shortly, will, I hope, be bringing forward a, um, uh, a requirement for solar to be part of future development. Thank you. Um, I, I think Mike Kay on Energy Oasis has, uh, has had some very good free publicity tonight. I think I should say that other energy consultants are available. Um, but uh, Mike is, uh, Mike is a, uh, one of our um, supporters and volunteers with Zero Carbon Harrogate, so I think we'll give him credit there. So. Um, we're going to, we, we've touched briefly um, on um, farming and land use when we were thinking about the nature and emergency crisis. But I'd like us to think now a little bit about uh, food and farming, um, given that agriculture um, actually accounts for the largest portion of carbon emissions for Yorkshire, not particularly for this part of Yorkshire, but for Yorkshire, uh, for North Yorkshire, sorry, North Yorkshire as a whole, because we are a very rural um, uh, uh, region. Um, so the question which we'll be starting with Conrad um, is whilst the food we eat is an intensely personal decision, what actions would you take to accelerate the decarbonisation of our food supply? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent point around that. I think we just need a strategy and a plan. I don't think we should be afraid of us, you know, farming is often seen so independently as a, a free market enterprise and then any talks around having central planning or things people have naturally backed away from uh, for fear of over-involvement. I think now we're moving towards a phase and we saw this happen during the pandemic and I think this is what will be emblematic of a Labour government. It's private and public working together, public-private partnerships that can be efficient and generate the, the, the food that we're going to need locally. So Labour's agriculture plan is going to start addressing that. In terms of making it cleaner and greener, farming we know takes up an awful lot of energy in terms of actually the production of the food. And that's right, the food that we eat is a, a personal choice, but that's not to say we shouldn't give farmers the opportunity for homegrown uh, clean energy. So that's where Great British Energy comes in again, which I've been told I talk about too much, but it is my favourite. Uh, and I would also just say that Labour's got a strong plan on rural crime as well. We know that a lot of farmers feel pushed out and bullied out of their areas sometimes due to the large amounts of crime that happen in rural areas. So Labour's plan on rural crime would tack down on that as well. Thanks. So the Liberal Democrats, we announced that we want to see a £1 billion uh, fund to underpin the farming sector and help farmers who are really struggling. I think um, the key point about when it comes to carbon um, is it's about choosing local um, and promoting um, local choice and of local produce where possible. Um, you know, there's a, a massive carbon impact on food miles. Um, and I think this is why when we um, ended up with these dodgy trade deals with New Zealand and Australia undercutting our own farmers, it was absolutely crackers. We've been now importing lamb from places like New Zealand and Australia um, from the other side of the world, which, you know, when you think about food miles, you can't get much further than that. Um, you know, and part of the key to that is going to be fixing our broken relationship with Europe um, and making sure that we trade with our partners on our doorstep. That's why we do it, because they're geographically located close to us. Um, but, you know, where we can, um, it should be a case of growing locally and supporting local business. Thank you. A very good question. Food security is very dear to me, and I believe the farmers are part of the solution. But we have to support the farmers. We have to know and we have to ask the farmers what that support might look like so that we can really help them. At the moment, we produce only 17% of our fruit in this country and 55% of our vegetables. We could do much better than that. I've, I've talked to three different vertical, uh, vertical farm suppliers who would want to run their vertical farm in conjunction with what I would call classic or 
conve conventional farming. And so there is room for manoeuvre here. I've also seen uh, some of the uh, work at, uh, at Selby greenhouses where they spray carbon uh, dioxide across the plants to increase the speed of growth. So carbon dioxide can be used as, uh, as uh, a friend as well as perhaps being a danger. We do need shorter supply chains and we effectively need to do a lot more to get things into our local shoe, uh, shops and councils and schools. Thank you. Well, the correct answer to lots of questions is to keep it local, and that's certainly true when it comes to food production. We have high-quality food production, high-quality farmers in this country. Uh, we certainly need to help them uh, embrace some of the new technologies which are available, uh, but at the heart of uh, food supply is a, a series of farms, thousands of businesses right across the country. We've just introduced environmental land management schemes. These have replaced the common agricultural policy. Uh, basically, the common agricultural policy paid farmers more on the size of their land rather than how they managed it. The land management schemes are now about, uh, quite frankly, balancing that. So farmers are paid for public good. That includes things like environmental stewardship, cleaner air, cleaner water. And we have 55,000 of these agreements in place across the country. So the correct answer, keep it local, work with farmers. British farmers are very good. Let's support them. Working uh, with nature. With farmers are very good at that. And um, I'll just go through what, what uh, we, we say in our manifesto here. Triple support to farmers over the next five-year parliament to support the transition to nature-friendly farming conserve and improve the health of the soil and the wider environment, which in turn would lead to cleaner rivers, offer sustainable employment, decent livelihoods, career opportunities, good working conditions, and ongoing training to those involved in growing food, better educate the population about food and health, and build links between farm schools and the wider community, encourage a move to mixed farming along with a reduction in meat and dairy production, and implement new horticulture support for fruit and vegetable production, link farm payments to a reduction in the use of pesticides and other agrochemicals, and unfair end unfair trade deals. Thank you. So, thank you very much for uh, covering that one. Um, we're going to be thinking a little bit now about our pathway to net zero. Um, and just uh, our next question, which came, comes from James Buckley, James? Oh, no, sorry, did you, I think James couldn't be here tonight, actually. So, um, James is asking about the carbon emissions that we know we won't be able to um, deal with um, and uh, how, we, how we are going to, uh, um, in relation to offsetting. So, his question is, um, North Yorkshire has pledged to be net zero by 2034 and carbon negative by 2040. Assuming we are able to make all necessary reductions to our carbon footprint, how do you plan to account for all remaining emissions when offset measures are still so underdeveloped and poorly regulated? Um, and we're starting with Tom. So there's a whole host of different things that we need to do to get to grips with a problem. Um, I think one of the things that we've got in our manifesto that's really key is having a general duty of care for the environment in business operations and supply chains. Um, unless we have that as a core principle throughout everything we do, it's uh, fundamentally going to end up selling ourselves short. Um, the other thing we want to see as well is the appointment of a Chief Secretary for Sustainability to the Treasury to ensure that um, sustainability is key throughout and um, we have proper efforts to reduce carbon across the board. This isn't necessarily a problem we're going to be able to deal with just here in North Yorkshire, but it is one which is going to require a countrywide approach, um, not just for the UK, but also you know, the devolved nations too, and giving them the powers that they need to be able to do the work that they need to be able to do. Um, I think that for all intents and purposes, you know, we need more investment in R&D to bring forward new technologies and we've seen a chronic under, un, underfunding in that sector and it's not been helped by uh, underfunding of our educational institutions and universities. We need the best and brightest here and we should be encouraging people to come and study in green tech. The simple fact of the matter is that uh, at the end of the day we will have to find some way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
However, here in North Yorkshire, we have a superb opportunity and we need to work on the peat, uh, the, the peat bog restoration. About 80% of them are damaged at the moment, but if we were to repair all of those, then they would have the sequestra sequestration equivalent to all the trees in Germany and France. So I'd be looking to repair our peat bogs because the question was about what we're going to do locally. Thank you. I think natural solutions, I think Paul is, is quite right here. Natural solutions are going to be a very important part of this. I see peat bogs, I see tree planting, uh, but one area that hasn't been mentioned is carbon capture and storage, so that's stopping uh, carbon uh, emissions and then storing it uh, under the probably the sea uh, in strata of rocks. So I think there's going to be a variety of issues uh, that we or initiatives that we can take forward. Uh, the question was about offsetting and how poorly regulated and how poorly developed that is. I think that is slightly true here actually because it's a new area and regulations haven't really quite kept pace with the uh, with, with the questions. So I think there's a bit of work to be done on a regulatory basis nationally, and natural solutions on a local basis, and carbon capture and storage, which is a mixture of national and local. Thank you, Andrew. Oh. Yeah, uh, offsetting is what happens when you haven't managed to do it other, in other ways, and nature is the best way. Soil in good health um, is a natural carbon sink and uh, we've said that subsidies should fully support our farmers, including smaller and family farms, to invest in bringing land back into good health and making it a carbon sink rather than a carbon emitter. Um, the pr process of claiming should also be made simple and straightforward. I think farmers have struggled with, with all of that. And uh, we should also look at international cooperation in terms of research and development to find the best ways of looking after those, the, the carbon that hasn't been dealt with in that way. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, This question slightly scares me. And the reason it scares me is because we have moved, it feels like, over the course of the time I've certainly been interested in politics, from the discussion of how we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to meet net zero and how we mitigate against what we've already done. To me, that's a really worrying prospect that we have already released so much carbon and emissions that we're going to end up uh, with a, a, an incre a planet that em endlessly increases in temperature without us being able to do anything about it, unless, of course, we step up to the plate and try something new. Like I said at the beginning, this is something that I feel very, very strongly about uh, as a young person, seeing this in my, in my relatively near future. Uh, carbon capture and storage, for me, has to be one of the main particular areas. I think if we can utilise for the new technology that is coming out, I appreciate it is an under-regulated sector, but so are a lot of the new sectors that are emerging. So I think that having a Labour government that is able to have a grown-up approach to this and understand what the plan is... Uh, will, yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, call you in. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Doing very well on the timing generally. Thank you. Um, so our, our next question gets a little bit more personal. And um, this comes from Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Jonathan, for the question. Good to have you with us this evening. Um, and Jonathan asks you, what do you do on a day-to-day -day level that makes a difference regarding the climate or the nature and the nature crisis? Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask Sunita to be a little bit slacker on the timing if you need a little bit longer to explain what you do. I'm hoping the answers are going to be long. Uh, and we start with Paul. Yeah, so uh, I have um, 11 and a half kilowatts of solar panels. I have heat source pumps. I have battery storage. I have a car that's a plug-in hybrid, so I'm doing my best. And I know not everybody can do it, can, can afford, necessarily afford these things, but these are things I've invested in. I invested in them several years ago. Um, I also do some obscure things like uh, I won't buy bottled water, but I will filter my water and I put it into bottles and I put it into my fridge. I reckon that saves me about a thousand pounds a year, not least the amount of plastic that it stops me from having to take down to the recycling every other week. So uh, we try and do a number of things. We try and make sure that one. Well, uh, 
all, all my wife's journeys uh, in the car tend to be within the uh, within the uh, energy power of the battery and the battery and the car we charge during this when the sun lights out so we're trying to use as much of the energy we generate as possible there are, I guess there are a number of other things uh, we walk I run most places I can and you'll see me running around the district having a look around at the moment uh, so watch out for me and stop me if you wish uh, to have a chat thank you thank you Paul going to Andrew well, I uh, take a general approach of, sort of reduce, recycle and reuse. Uh, in terms of personal consumption, I always buy local and work to uh, reduce personal energy use. The uh, interesting thing we're doing at the moment is working up a scheme to put solar uh, on... I live in a block of flats in the town centre. And we're working up a scheme to get solar on the roof, which is actually proving to be remarkably complicated and it is highlighting some planning areas which need significant work. Um, so uh, I follow through my pronouncements with my personal actions. Like another politician, I'm a grocer's daughter. My mum was also a home economist who drummed into me that waste is bad. We don't waste food. In fact, I rescue food from waste wherever I can, supporting people like uh, Resurrected Bites and... Um, trying to rescue food from where I think it's going to landfill. Uh, in fact, that's what we live on. Um, if I run the kitchen tap for hot water, the cold for water is saved for plants. Um, we make our own compost. I have an allotment. My garden is for wildlife and raspberries and relaxing in. I refuse first, reuse and upcycle. Any clothes I buy are from charity shops. Uh, if I buy new stuff, my cr criteria is that it has to be local and or ethical. For example, they do wonderful gifts in Lush and the Oxfam and Fair Trade Shops. Uh, use the bus, don't fly, really think hard before using the car. Um, and at home, we've got an air source heat pump. We were able to, to do that and put solar panels. Um, so we use very little water and energy, our very low bills, and we put energy back into the um, system. There's probably more, but I can't remember them. And your time is up, so perfect. <laughs> um, so I don't have a car. Uh, I, don't, I don't drive. I can drive. Um, I actually passed my driving test on Valentine's Day 2017, and it remains the best Valentine's Day I've ever had. Um, so I cycle, uh, and I use the train, got the train here. I'll be getting the train back unless uh, people want to ask me questions for long enough that I miss it, in which case I might need someone to give me a lift home. Um, but also I want to talk a little bit about fast fashion. So there is, that's a, a big problem with my generation. I think my generation, I've spoken at the start about us having a very good reputation for climate activism, etc. But then there's sort of that contrast and that contradiction where there's a, a huge amount of fast fashion, the amount of clothes that particularly younger people, but all people uh, tend to, to throw away uh, at such short notice. So I make sure I buy locally, I buy from um, smaller independent shops as well, which is probably why I've worn the same suit for every hustings I've done. Um, but that's a really key thing for me. It's also making sure that I use a renewable energy company, so that's what I do. Uh, I have my own herb garden in my flat, which is uh, something that, a very small way, not quite the allotment that uh, Shan has, but it's something. Um, and also, I, I, <laughs> I'm a candidate for a party that I think has the best policies for the environment, so that's part of my personal life, but I do actually think the Labour Party will be able to deliver for the environment. Thank you. Well, I'm a little bit miffed. You stole my joke about wearing the same outfit for the third <laughs> hustings in a row. Um, you know, I think, just for any doubt, I don't think Conrad is the only young one. I am just 30, so I'm not, um, I think, uh, much older. Um, but again, I think, you know, as someone who is young, you have to sometimes make those choices because of the cost of things, too. Um, I'm fortunate. I do have a car. I've sort of needed a car for caring responsibilities that I've had in the past. Um, I do, where possible, travel by public transport. I... Um, we, we opened a new office recently and it conveniently is located all of one minute walk away from my house. Um, <laughs> pretty much most of the facilities and services that I use are within a five minute walk of my house. Um, you know, these ideas of 20 minute cities I think are quite frankly great. Um, I have my own little one with my office, the train station, as to all five minutes walk from my front door. Um, I, yeah, I don't own my own home. I'm not sure how my landlord would feel about me trying to put solar panels on the roof or install heat pumps. Um, again, I think that's a generational thing, perhaps. Um, but, you know, consciously, you know, when it comes to eating food, I would class myself as a meat reducer. Um, I do try to proactively make sure that I uh, reduce the amount of meat that I eat. Um, and again, sort of batch cook as well to make sure um, that I'm using energy as efficiently as possible. 
um, I think that's also partly down to the fact that you know life's busy as well. And we'll stop you there, Tom. Thank you. Um, we've covered quite a range of themes um, this evening, uh, but the more I understand about climate change, the more I see how it permeates through every area of our lives and is impacting on every area of our lives. So, um, in this last uh, question, which in, in a way is not really going to be a question, but I'd like to offer the candidates uh, the opportunity to say a few words about one area, whatever area they want, that we have not covered. We haven't talked particularly or had a question about consumption, for instance, or about industrial processes and the carbon emissions from our industries. We haven't talked particularly about waste and recycling. Uh, or the circular economy. I'm giving them ideas here, you see. And um, we, we haven't talked about where we sit within the UK and our policies in relation to global um, emissions and the reductions that are required globally. Um, we haven't talked about uh, how we're going to adapt to the climate that is already changed and the impacts that we're feeling day to day, week to week, with uh, the changes in our climate and the impacts that that has on health um, or how uh, health can impact on climate change, uh, the health service, or indeed the education system. So I throw those out to you to have a range of different topics that you might wish to address and uh, give you the opportunity uh, to pick up on one of those. Um, and I think it falls to Andrew now to start off on that um, and we yeah just have have the timer again just to give you a, maybe just over a minute if that's right Sunita just to give you a chance to warm to your theme <laughs> on any 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 or, uh, or others well I think that you're quite right and the impact of climate change will be profound globally uh, and locally one area I would just comment upon is that I don't think we get the communication and the discussions about climate change right at all. We tend to present it as either we're doomed or it's going to be a hair shirt future. And actually, I think it's quite the opposite. I think we should be embracing this as a positive. We should be enthusiastic about it. We're making an enormous difference, but we, we don't talk about it in the right way. Um, we, we see people present this as a giant problem rather than as a giant opportunity. As a result of that, I think we're starting to see a bit of a backlash. There was an article on the BBC News website uh, during the course the last couple of days talked about a green lash. Well, that is the last thing that we want. We want to, to people to embrace this issue, to go on the journey with us, because I think everybody here is very enthusiastic about it. But we have to take people with us, and I think the comms and the way we approach the issue needs to change. I'd actually agree with that. I think um, we've certainly got to change our attitude and education is a major part of that and that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I'll just tell you a little story about Boroughbridge today. I was in Boroughbridge and there, were, there was a little group of primary school children doing a little geography project and I spoke with them about it and they showed me their pictures of lots of buildings and, and I said, I've found a really interesting thing about Boroughbridge, Swifts do you know what a swift is? And they all looked and none of them knew what a swift was, not one of them. And uh, swifts are the most fantastic birds, I'm sure people here know, but they're birds that sleep on the wing and uh, go all the way to Africa or they're here for three months and they don't perch. Fantastic birds. And these kids had never heard of a swift, which I found very sad. I thought at least one of this big group of kids would know. And I think we, we really sadly missing educating our our children we've got the wrong we've got the wrong model in our education system uh, it's it's all about stem subjects and stuff and nature you know the lost words the the words nature words like conquer goldfinch cuckoo are being taken out of the oxford children's dictionary it's all wrong um, that needs to change and uh, we yeah it, if if you don't understand and love something how can you look after it I think we're all hitting on the same theme here tonight, which is that it's easy to be nihilistic 
and, and, and panic and, and, and be deeply sad. This is an opportunity for us. And I think we've spoken about the positives that we think here, positives for air quality. It's not just about the planet, but it's also about being able to breathe easier as you walk down the street and, and such small things as that. The transfer growth and opportunity. I won't mention the thing that I've been mentioning all night, but I think you will understand that I, I, do, I do genuinely believe that this can be positive for our economy and provide that growth that we've been so desperately lacking. I do also want to talk, funnily enough, about human rights. Now, I did touch on this briefly earlier, but the truth of the matter is, for as long as we've been importing gas or oil, we've been importing it from regimes that simply do not care about human rights, do not share our values. And we've been doing it for ages, and we've kind of accepted it. People put it to the back of their heads that they're car they're filling up with or the um, gas heater that they're using was extracted and sold to you and they profit and a regime that is awful profited from it. That doesn't have to be the way. If we have got our own homegrown energy solutions that come from renewables, that come from nuclear, we are going to start seeing some of these international regimes like Russia that had, did rely and, and, and funded their war through selling their gas reserves. If we start to cut off that supply as well, which we have done through sanctions, we can start seeing a real opportunity for change for the human rights of the people. Poor people who have to live under those regimes. So that's something for us to think about as well. Thank you, Conrad. Tom. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for some of those fantastic suggestions. Um, I'm going to deviate slightly and talk about a real local issue. So we have seen in the last year a record number of hours of sewage been discharged into our rivers. Um, the impact on our rivers and our natural environment from um, water companies is environmental vandalism. We know the impact on fishing, on people um, who swim in the rivers too. On the same day that the NID was granted bathing water status, kids were actually getting issued with letters and sent home from King James School um, as they'd been ill after swimming in, in the river over the weekend. Um, what we want to see done on that is we want water companies reformed, we want off what given teeth, we want to see Yorkshire Water turned into a public benefit company where instead of paying out two million pounds in bonuses um, to chief execs, that money is actually reinvested into the infrastructure that will stop this crime. Before Parliament was um, dissolved, there was a bill passing through and we got an amendment to that which would have seen water companies and water bosses prosecuted for their destruction of our rivers and our Conservative MP and his colleagues voted against it. Now I don't believe that we're going to see a solution to this problem until the water companies are held to the same level of accountability that you or I would be if we were to go dumping stuff in the river. Um, so getting a grip with the, uh, the sewage scandal is really top of the agenda locally. Yeah, I, I actually want to come back to food uh, and what people eat, uh, but in particular in relation to the NHS. The NHS at the moment is being overwhelmed, and part of that problem is the number of people that are obese, therefore getting type 2 diabetes, getting musculoskeletal problems, uh, and hypertension, which I think is a technical word for blood pressure. I would want to be really working on, on the food supply, and also looking at how we move the money out of the NHS by doing prevention of illness rather than the, the treatment of symptoms. Uh, and I think we need to move that money into food security and obviously that means farming. Now it's a long term project, it might take 10, 15 years, but we have to put certainty into this to make it work because we all need to be healthier and happier and if we're going to achieve all the goals we want to achieve, then it's important uh, that we give people the right balanced diet. So I would be going for the NHS and food security. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, Andrew, Andrew would like the right to reply to Tom's comment, and Tom would then possibly like to reply as well. So as I say, if we, if, Andrew, if you want to reply, Tom would also like to reply to you, if that's okay. Well, the accusation made is, uh, I'm afraid, incorrect. The Speaker didn't call the Lib Dem amendment, and he's investigating why the Lib Dems put out a press release saying that we'd voted against something when the vote never even took place. All checkable in Hansard. However, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a pattern here, uh, which is that the Lib Dems have claimed repeatedly that Conservative MPs have refused to ban sewage dumping in rivers. Please go back and look at the uh, actual vote that took place. 
It was a vote on the Duke of Wellington's amendments that came from the House of Lords, and it was requiring water companies to progressively reduce the harm that they were doing. But it did not explicitly state that the practice should be stopped, and we didn't vote to block them. We voted to amend the plans to protect water bill payers. Simple as that. So I'm afraid to say we've had some misrepresentation of what has happened in votes, and it, actually I think everybody right across Parliament and right across the political parties want to see our water improved. I don't think it's necessary to do party politics in that way when everybody actually agrees, and I think we should all be just working together to achieve it. I think achieving bathing water status for the River Nid was a very positive development. Uh, it actually... Andrew, I'm going to ask you to wrap up, because I was going to say, it, I think we, uh, we, we've had and, some very good questions, okay. so I don't want to, to dwell well, on this uh, right. overly. Thank I'll just you. quickly say, it was a huge community effort. We had councils, we had community groups, we had companies, and we had 200 volunteers all working to achieve that status. Let's not undermine that work, which was a big community effort, and I was very proud to lead it. And Tom, I'm going to give you the opportunity to reply. I'm then going to actually, as you and Andrew have had the opportunity to say something extra, I'm going to allow uh, Paul and then Sean and then Conrad to say something uh, additional if they would like, because uh, I think that is only fair that we, if you, you've uh, had a little bit of extra airtime. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say, yeah, it's taken a bit of an unexpected turn. Um, I don't know about anyone else in this audience, but I am absolutely tired of being gaslit by this Conservative government. I've been told that things are getting better, that votes don't count. If you go on they vote where they work for you, you can see on there the breakdown of every single vote that any MP has taken. And it will say on there that Conservative MPs, including ours, has broadly speaking voted against steps that would have stopped sewage dumping. Um, you know, it's, it is that clear. Um, I think, for me, it's just about honesty. Um, you know, we have repeatedly seen steps taken by the government to undermine abilities and efforts to actually get to grip with these problems, whether it be sewage, whether it be the climate, envir uh, climate emergency. Um, you know, I think... Well, this is not very respectful, is it, Andrew? I mean, the other point, you know, you talk about working together and being positive. Um, you know, I don't really see that right now. Um, I, you know, I've met with members of an inaction group and they feel slightly hijacked to some of them. Um, the point I would make is you can go on They Work For You and actually look at voting records and I don't think anyone's going to be fooled. Thank you, Tom. Right, so, um, Paul, you, you have the opportunity now to have uh, um, a, a little slot, a, a minute, uh, to uh, say your, whatever you would like to say. So I'm not going to come between these two uh, uh, because I think that's just dangerous and, and I could get hit from both sides. Uh, I think we can all agree that uh, sewage in the water is not what we want. I work very actively with an action group. I don't actually make it very public. I work behind the scenes. I've done a lot of work with them. You can ask, uh, you can ask them if you wish. One of the other things I did was it was me that put forward uh, the uh, uh, the motion, notice of motion at North Yorkshire Council for the bathing water status to support Andrew's efforts, so uh, and the action group's efforts. So I think you know uh, there's a number of things going on, and I think the local community is working hard. Recently, I uh, I mapped Bilton Beck, which has got a uh, combined sewage outflow into it. So we're quite keen on monitoring that locally. So we're doing things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it all comes to the, for me, the river issue is a, it's a metaphor for what's happening to everything. Um, everything has been run uh, by the government on a neoliberal basis, which is about putting profits before people and before nature. It's as simple as that. You look right across the board and you see it on everything. Farming, education, rivers, air, transport. That's how I see it. Uh, there's just not, there has not been the political commitment. We have to have political commitment from the top and internationally, working with other nations if we're going to make headway with this issue. Thank you. And Conrad. Thank you. Um, I've got two brothers, and that exchange between Andrew and Tom gave me flashbacks. So I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about 
what I think Labour's plan will be able to be, particularly when it comes to giving off what tough new powers, uh, the bonuses that water bosses have been paid whilst pumping sewer, uh, sewage into the river, those would have been blocked if the Labour plan had been in place. I think that's really important. People shouldn't be rewarded for this kind of behaviour. Um, but while we're on the topic of mudslinging, I do think people are tired of that in politics. That's what I've heard on the doorstep. And I made a commitment at the start of this campaign, at the very first hustings, sat round about here, where I said I'm going to be talking my policies up, not my opponents down, because we are all sick to death of politicians taking lumps out of each other and causing problems for one another when we should be talking about how we want to help people. And I've always said, I don't care if I get 50 votes or 50,000 votes. I want to know that on the 5th of July, I'll be able to look every single one of you in the eye and say, I did the right thing. I didn't get down in the gutter and I treated myself with the dignity that you deserve. Conrad, thank you very much. Uh, that is a very uh, good point to end our questions. Um, and we're going to move to having, uh, g giving you one minute to sum up. And I think we have come round to it being Sean's uh, turn to start, if I've got that right. Um, so, uh, Sunita's going to give you your one minute timer, and when you're ready, we'll just uh, move into our final summing up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think growth, we've got to think very carefully about growth. What sort of growth do we want, um, if any? Well, growth in values, which value things that actually matter to people, things like their family, their health, and their education, and obviously being able to buy what they need. But we have to have a more equal society, which has to be done through the taxation system. In this country, for some reason, we've got this race to the bottom with tax, the attitude towards taxation, whereas you look at Scandinavia, they understand that you have to have fair taxation in order to have public services. That's a very basic part of the, the green philosophy. Um, I think we've also got to be very careful about democracy and um, the way that protesters are being treated, being uh, treated as criminals when they are trying to protect uh, our environment and people who are vulnerable. That is a very frightening way that we're going and I think we all have to be very vigilant about that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and, and Zara Carver and Harrogate for hosting this because uh, democracy happens because people are willing to come and listen to people like us sat in front of them and, and, and state their case. Uh, I do think that there has been a broad range of agreement across the panel. It's nice to see that almost everyone on the ballot when you vote on the 4th of July will believe in climate change and want to do something about it. Now, my argument as the candidate for this constituency has always been that I believe that there will be a Labour government. I think that Keir Starmer will become Prime Minister. And what is better for the town or for the constituency than to have a member of that government being able to make that case when we talk about locally developing our energy sources, strengthening our supply chains or having sustainable farming, all of which will be able to contribute towards a green growing economy. Those things are possible. And when we have proper economic growth, we can have that kind of spending to build a more equitable society. I am passionately pro house building, but I'm also passionately pro environment. And I hope that you will vote Labour on the 4th of July. Thank you. Uh, coming up to Tom, please, the microphone. Thank you. I, take, I would urge everyone to, when they get home, close their eyes for a moment and imagine that you're waking up the day after the general election and faced with the prospect of another five years of more of the same. Um, we can't, and our planet and the climate emergency simply can't take that. Um, I'm in the Liberal Democrats because I believe in fairness and I think I agree with a lot of what other panellists have said tonight. What is key is that climate change needs to be at the heart of the next government. Um, but also we need to make sure we have a system that works and recognises these issues. Uh, we need more voices in Parliament, a diverse range of voices in Parliament, including people from other political parties like the Greens. That's why the Liberal Democrats want to see uh, a fairer voting system that would enable that discussion and change politics, incentivising people to work together, not shout people down. Um, for me, it has been an incredible experience over the last 18 months of going out five nights a week, knocking on doors and speaking to people, and I am greatly, greatly humbled by whatever happens. What is key is that climate, the climate emergency is one of the big issues of our day, and I'm glad that the majority of people in this town and um, villages around here too recognise that. I 
as an independent candidate, I differ from the other candidates by focusing on local issues, voting by conscious and directly accountable to constituents. I offer innovative perspectives, work across all party lines, and I will challenge the status quo. I hope my flexibility and direct representation will also engage, engage with disillusioned voters and strengthen democracy through diverse, inclusive representation. We need to protect the environment and combat climate change. However, we'll not achieve it without bringing others along. So while good governance and faster action are required, so is a just transition. So I have proposals on combating the cost of living, driving the economy, transport and connectivity, health and social uh, care, community cohesion equality, security and safety, and national policies. So if you want to know more about me, I've got my uh, environmentally friendly cards at the back, uh, and it has a QR code, and my website has a CO2 monitor on it. Thank you. Well, I think that hitting net zero, obviously just a legal requirement, but it's much, much more than that. It is a critical challenge for our planet, and that means taking responsibility at personal, corporate, and especially at governmental levels. We have made world-leading progress in this country, but we have to press on. I've made it a personal priority for me and my work, and if I'm re-elected, I'd be doing the same again. That would mean delivering and making the positive case for action, highlighting the environmental and the economic benefits. Now, we talked about communication earlier. I think the opportunities are exciting, and our challenge is to take advantage of those. I've stood up to make sure that our area received a good share of funding. That meant working with community groups who've made a big impact, working with companies, working with public bodies, and of course as part of the government. And that's because I view this as a team game, a big collective effort. That's what I have done, and that's what I would continue to do if given the chance, remembering that there is a big prize at the end of that, and that is net zero achieved and a great legacy for future generations. Can I, on your behalf, thank all of the candidates uh, for addressing a really broad range of uh, questions? And it's clear that um, we have a huge uh, wealth of knowledge and understanding here. Um, and I'd encourage you to come and uh, talk to the candidates, or if you'd like to get to know them um, a little bit more. Um, Tim and I uh, had the pleasure of um, having a, a sit down and more of an informal interview uh, with each of them, apart from Tom, we need to book you in Tom for one of our interviews, um, and those are on our website, so if you'd like to watch those back and get to know the candidates a little bit more, please do have a look at those. Um, but I'd really like to thank the candidates for uh, the hard work that they've done this evening in answering uh, so many questions and for uh, doing so well and sticking to time as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank Wesley Chapel and Julian for hosting us uh, so well this evening. Um, I'd like to thank um, Tim Cook from The Informer who's been here filming and uh, Tom Barrett from uh, Local Democracy Reporter uh, because I think it's really important that our press are here and are reporting on uh, this campaign and thank you for uh, your hard work. It's a busy time for you. Um, and um, I'd like to thank you for your support of uh, Zero Carbon Harrogate and the work that we're trying to do locally to uh, drive towards a, um, a net zero economy um, and for your support this evening. And um, I hope that you will be taking some of what you've learned and, and talking with your friends and your colleagues and encouraging them to engage constructively uh, in this democratic process. Um, so thank you very much for coming as well. And again, thank you for the candidates for working so hard uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you.